for your interest in utility woodpole standards. My name is Nelson Bingle, and I'm chairman of the Accredited Standards Committee 05, which is ASC 05, and that committee produces the standards to manufacture new wood poles and cross arms. I'm also chairman of the National Electrical Safety Code, which publishes a code every five years and addresses the safety requirements for the construction, operation, and maintenance of overhead and underground lines. So why are wood poles still the predominant material to be used for overhead lines? Well, they have a proven performance since the early 1900s, and everybody is familiar with wood poles. On top of that, they have a long lifespan. When we look at 45 years as a national average for the life of a pole without remedial treatment, I just want to clarify is that the criteria used to determine that is the fact that the NESC allows a wood pole to lose a third of its strength before it has to be restored or replaced. So we're saying that's the end of the useful life. So at 45 years, half of the poles will have strength reduced more than a third, and the other half will have greater strength than that. And so by applying remedial treatments and controlling the decay process, you can actually extend the average life to 75 years, where some poles will last longer that than that and some won't. So it certainly is proven performance, and it has lowest cost both initially and for the full cycle life costs. And you know, most poles are serviced from bucket trucks today, but there are still plenty of poles in backyards and where trucks are not accessible, where the climbability of a wood pole is an advantage. The supply chain has shown in recent disasters and all through the years for that matter, that the supply chain can provide the poles required for timely restoration after a major event. And wood poles have, are good insulators. They're resilient to the wind and mechanical impacts. They're easy to maintain because most of the maintenance is right at the ground line. And if you're in the field and need to modify a pole, you get out a drill and you drill a hole or whatever is required and bang, the modification is done. One thing you may not think about is the fact that wood poles are green or more environmentally friendly compared to poles manufactured from other materials. Wood poles are a renewable and sustainable product and life cycle studies show they have a much lower impact on the environment compared to steel, concrete, and fiber reinforced composite poles. Many of you may be familiar with ANSI, the American National Standards Institute. As it turns out, ANSI does not actually publish any standards. Rather, they oversee the procedures and standards developing organizations that are producing standards. This is a national consensus standard, and they oversee the group to make sure that they maintain openness and a balance of membership, consensus, and due process. So that's the role of ANSI, and ASC05 is an accredited ANSI committee. One of the things we have to maintain on the committee is a balance between membership, and we've got three categories. Users, which would be utility people. Producers, of course, manufacture the poles. And then general interest. And we do maintain that balance so that there's input from all parties. Interestingly, ASC05 was founded in 1924. And today, the American Wood Protection Association is the secretariat and standards are revised on a five-year cycle. Let's take a look at the output of ASC 05 committee. You see here 05.1 is poles, 05.2 glue lamb, and 05.3 is cross arms. Now we have some other standards, but I'd like to bring attention to the photographic manual. It's a great tool for people that are new to the industry to have pictures to understand growth rings and the pith center of a pole. So you might consider that in your business. Here's a screenshot of the website, the home page for ASC05, and that's the address. And on another page, 
you can see where it's available to purchase all the standards. And there's also an abundance of additional information posted here. So it's worthwhile to look through that and see what kind of, kind of information will be useful to you. So let's take a look at the standard that is most often used, which is ANSI 05.1. In the scope, it clearly lays out the fact that this standard addresses single poles in a simple cantilever installation, which means it's fixed at the ground line and bends at the top. It also addresses only transverse loading, which is the wind loads blowing on the wires, trying to blow the poles over sideways. And that's the strength that we need to be able to resist the wind loads. And it clarifies that all of the strengths in this standard are specified at the ground line of a pole. And when we mention the ground line, it's interesting to note that when you have a pole like this, solid, round, and tapered, installed in a cantilever installation, then the maximum stress point, which is the place where you expect a pole to break, is where the diameter of the pole is one and a half times the diameter of the load point. And as you see here, distribution poles don't often have enough taper so that the location of the pole where the diameter is one and a half times the diameter at the load point is either at ground line or even below. Now it also happens that ground line is where poles are most prone to decay. And that's why it's so important to inspect and maintain utility poles to retain the structural integrity as decay as a direct reduction in the pole's bending capacity. I'd like to explain that ANSIO 5.1 addresses four functions or qualities about wood poles. And the first is the wood quality. The others are related in that, first of all, the standard establishes class loads. You've heard of poles class 3, class 4. They refer to a horizontal load applied two feet from the tip. And we'll explain that. Fiber strength is the strength of each species of poles that are manufactured, and they're not all the same. And because of that, the pole dimensions have to be adjusted so that different species of poles with different strengths have the dimensions adjusted to provide and support the same class loads. Here are some examples of wood quality. Allowable knots, allowable sweep in a pole, number of growth rings per inch. Those all address wood quality. The standard also addresses how to mark and use code letters on the wood poles. You see here the abbreviations for species and then here's the specification for the brand on the pole where you have to identify the pole treater, the specific plant where it was done and when, the species and treatment, and the length and class. And you'll notice up above, for poles that are 50 feet and shorter, the brand is to be placed 10 feet from the butt. So if you've got a 40-foot pole and you can measure from the bottom of the brand to the ground line, then you take that distance from the 10 feet and you know how deep the pole is set. For poles that are taller than 50 feet, the brand is supposed to be spaced 14 feet from the butt. And once again, it gives you some sense for how deep the pole has been set. Now we mentioned transverse loading earlier and this is a depiction of that to show that depending on the loading district you're in you may need to add ice to the wire size and the wind then blows perpendicular to the wires and that's what the class loads are all about to model and simulate the wind loads on the pole thinking that a cross arm is one or two feet from the tip of the pole. You can see here the full range of classes from 10 to H6. And in actual application, the lower loaded poles, like the class 7 with 1,200 pounds, typically are poles that only have telecom on them, no electric. And then you've got your common distribution poles in the middle, class 5 through 2, and that's not to say in some cases there wouldn't be a class one on distribution. And then in transmission, you've got quite a broad span, but obviously you can see 
the higher capacity poles are used in the transmission world. Now the strengths you see here, for example, a class three with 3,000 pounds, represent an average strength. So that means for all class three poles, half of them will break at a higher load and half will break at a lesser load, unlike poles that are classified by minimum strengths. To give you a graphic view of this, this bell curve represents perhaps testing a thousand poles. And as you see the dotted yellow line, those would be poles that broke exactly at 3,000 pounds. Everything to the right was broke at a higher level and those to the left a l lesser level. When you look at the two 34.1% sections there, they represent each one a standard deviation. And then that in turn is the coefficient of variation. So what this shows for wood poles is that 68% of the pole population would be within a portion of the curve that is plus or minus 20% of the 3,000. Now when we look at steel poles compared to wood poles, you can see they have a much tighter coefficient of variation. It's an engineered product that can be controlled to a much tighter degree. When we look at the equal design point, what this means is whether it's wood or steel, 95% of the poles will be able to exceed that equal design load there. What happens sometimes, obviously, is you get a major storm and the load exceeds the original design loads. What you can see now is the fact that because of that variability of wood, there are quite a few poles who would still survive in that storm load where it's more likely than most of the steel poles would not have. When you hear about utilities replacing wood poles with steel poles to quote harden their system, it's not that steel poles necessarily perform better than wood. If they're designed to the same load like you see here, they'll perform equally. The benefit of an engineered product though is you can engineer it to much higher strengths and so the curve for the steel poles could be placed beyond the storm load that you see here and they would then perform better in the storm. However, the cost goes up significantly when that happens too. So we've talked about that horizontal load applied two feet from the tip of a pole. Let's see how it functions as the applied bending load. That load, in this case, let's choose 3,000 pounds again, is multiplied by the distance from the ground line. In this case, let's say 30. So we're now applying 90,000 foot-pounds to this pole. So the applied bending load is basically that horizontal load times the distance to the ground line. And it's expressed in foot-pounds because you've got a distance and you've got a force. And these classes shown here are typical for distribution poles. One thing that keep in mind here is that a class load for every length of pole stays the same. So you have a class 4 pole here, 2400 pounds on a 40 foot. So at the ground line it's experiencing 76,800 foot pounds. Now we look at a 50 foot class 4 and notice it has the same horizontal load but it's taller and so at the ground line it's experiencing 98,400 foot-pounds. So just a reminder class loads always stay the same but the bending capacity or load at the ground line is different with the length of the pole. Now fiber strength is the strength of the wood for each species of pole and when we apply bending like this pole goes into compression on one side and tension on the other side and it will eventually break. And when it breaks we look at the amount of pressure that was occurred at that occurred at the ground line in the cross section and we look at a square inch of wood like this and that becomes the fiber strength. That's where numbers like 8,000 psi and 6,000 psi come into play. So the code looks at all the test data evaluates that and says, okay, the fiber strength for southern pine is 8,000. Now when we take that value and determine the bending capacity of the pole, 
you'll notice that the capacity goes up by the cube of the circumference. And that's a significant aspect. Fiber strength is a direct relation. So if a pole has 20% increase in fiber strength, it's, that pole is 20% stronger. But when the circumference is increased, it increases by the cube of that. And we can show you that in an example. These two poles are drawn to scale, a 26 inch and a 34 inch. And that represents a 30% increase in circumference. But notice it more than doubles the bending capacity of the pole. And that's where that circumference cube factor comes into play. And you may have heard the term in the past that 80 to 90% of a pole's bending strength is in the outer two to three inches of shell. And this is where that comes from.